Good morning. And uh, for some of you uh, overseas in, uh, in France, bonsoir. Uh, my name is Richard Sharp and I'm the CMO of uh, Simple Field. Today, uh, we have a really, really exciting topic and, and panel for you. It's uh, what does digital transformation actually mean for retail in these trying and crazy times? Um, it's a term that uh, gets bandied about um, and, and overused. Um, so we want to uh, talk to some people who actually know what it really means and, and uh, what to do about it. Um, so once again, I'm, I'm your moderator, uh, just a few ground rules. Uh, this webinar will run uh, about an hour. Um, it is being uh, recorded. Uh, you're being muted right now, uh, but you can easily ask questions by using the Q&A function in Zoom. You can see it um, down there on the, the left-hand side. Um, and introduce uh, our guests because these are people I'm really, really excited uh, to uh, introduce. Uh, first, I wanted to um, introduce you to Jonathan Tate, um, a guy that I've had the uh, pleasure to work with a little, little bit in the past, uh, one of the most uh, dynamic and engaging speakers I know on the subject of uh, digital transformation. Um, he's the Chief Data Officer at Louisiana Pacific. Um, he's also the uh, former Director of Enterprise Strategy at Nike and Walmart, and, and I'm not doing his, uh, his bio justice by uh, cutting out a bunch of the other really exciting roles that he's had. So Jonathan, welcome to our, uh, welcome to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Lisa Emlani, she's the uh, principal of uh, the Retail Strategy Group, which is a, a new firm that she has um, started um, on the, the tail end of um, recently um, exiting uh, her role as a senior retail strategist at uh, Accenture. Um, she's got a great background in retail, including um, a lot of uh, on the ground and, and strategy experience at Ralph Lauren and um, Club Monaco. So we're really happy to have her on the, the conversation as well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. And then finally, um, my, fr my friend and uh, uh, our VP of customer success here at Simple Field, um, uh, Jeremy Katz, who uh, manages and works with um, our, our biggest clients and is kind of the front face facing man um, who is delivering on a lot of the uh, transformation efforts that we have underway with the biggest um, companies in the world, kind of with a concentration on luxury and, and, um, and cosmetics, but um, in a bunch of other sectors as well. So uh, Jeremy has also uh, got a consulting background. He was in the salt mines of Cap Gemini in a, in a previous life and uh, has also uh, worked uh, briefly earlier in his career for LVMH, so a uh, great guy. Thanks, Rich. Welcome, everyone. Absolutely. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and, and get started. Um, I think one of the reasons why we uh, wanted to get into the subject of digital transformation, uh, for me, is we had a webinar, I think, uh, roughly three or four weeks ago um, about the future of, of luxury. and. Um, Erwan Ramborg, who's like one of the uh, biggest analysts in the, in the space, uh, told a joke. He was like, um, who's driving your digital transformation? Is it the uh, CIO? Is it your chief digital officer? Um, and he said, the answer is no, it's COVID. Um, we're, we're in this period of time of like of rapid acceleration um, where uh, digital transformation means uh, potentially something a little, little different. It's a word that continues to be bandied about, and um, you know it, you can make a drinking game out of it if you were to uh, drink every time the term was wildly misused. So we're we're hoping that you don't um, drink every time we use the word uh, digital transformation <laughs> in this call. You might, you might get a little hammered, um, uh, but we're going to try to dig into to what it means. So why don't I start um, with each of you um, explaining what you think the word digital transformation uh, means. And uh, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, um, I mean, that, there's a lot behind that. And I'll try to keep it brief. And uh, thanks again for having me, Rich. But, you know, I, I think of digital transformation fundamentally as um, a, a process in which you look at the value proposition of the company and you understand what's next in that value proposition. And then as you, you take that and boil that down, you typically have two types of digital transformation required to support that strategy, both an external uh, and an internal digital transformation. And, and, you know, to give you an example, externally, um, 
Porsche was, is a great example of this where uh, they realized they needed to get to a younger market. They needed to try uh, something different. They introduced a digital platform with a subscription based uh, a, you, you know, service that allows you to now go check out any Porsche that you would like. Well, similarly at Nike, uh, you know, we looked at our goals and our strategy, the value proposition of the company over the next five to 10 years and realized for us, it was going to be all about moving from a wholesale based market to a direct con to customer, direct consumer. Um, and to do that, it required a complete digital transformation, both in how we entered the market and how we delivered our product, but also how we managed uh, our business inside of Nike itself. Um, so we worked through, um, you know, really a, a, a multi-phase strategy and approach to look at end-to-end -end information and data and insights about our consumers, about our market, and about our product, and kick off strategies that um, really revamped our entire business model internally to get a, a better view of that data and that information across the entire enterprise. And one key aspect of that was an enterprise strategy around data and analytics, both from a technical lens and IT, but also a business lens. Um, and I bring that out as very important because that was also critically important to the success of a similar transformation in Walmart, um, where we had to look at data end to end um, from that business view and have a leader over that transformation, both from a business view and a technical view as well. Great. No, I mean, that's uh, obviously really valuable insights about um, two companies that are, are performing better than many uh, in the midst of um, of, of this pan pandemic. And I, I'm, I'm curious to expand a little bit on that. You know, um, do, how do you think that uh, the pan pandemic and the, the world of COVID has, has impacted um, those journeys for, for each of those companies? Yeah, I think in the past through digital transformation, it was, um, it, it was kind of an aspiration. So how could we, how could we look at our end-to-end -end supply chain and then product, uh, you know, and manufacturing um, our strategies and implement digital technologies that both consolidate and give us new capabilities within the company, but also give us a, a new platform or a new offering or revenue stream out in the market. And a lot of that hinged on digital technology, digital um, uh, marketplace, if you will, uh, data and analytics behind that to understand the effectiveness of that digital platform. Um, but it was always something that people, I think, strive for and had several years to go out and adopt. Now that COVID is here, we don't have that time or that luxury. It's a necessity uh, just to survive, to get our entire technology stack digitized and um, uh, give the ability back to employees to work remotely, um, to work really anywhere in the world if needed, uh, to collaborate remotely and in in, through digital technology, um, but also new ways to get to information, to get to data, to get to processes. Uh, we don't have the luxury anymore of sitting in an office and going to computers or systems or manufacturing lines or product lines to look at information. So all that has to be completely digitized. It has to be consolidated under an enterprise um, view, curated, and then produced back to the business. So um, it, it's definitely accelerated and forced everyone to really go to this digital platform immediately, both internally and for many companies externally as well as they rethink their, uh, their product strategies. Great, that's uh, that's incredible insight. Um, Lisa, I'll, I'll I'll turn to you. I know you, um, particularly at, at Accenture, you you worked with um, a number of the, the largest brands in the in the world on on their digital transformation efforts. Um, you know what what did digital transformation mean to you then, and kind of what does it mean to you now? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, digital transformation really just means the simplification and modernization of processes from your end to end, whether it is um, from product creation, whether it's uh, merchandising, whether it's actually going to market, and then of course, um, what, what you see in your stores. So it's really all about the simplification and modernization, but it must be centered around the customer. Um, I think that is the biggest, biggest um, challenge that a lot of retailers have right now, where they're not customer centric and they're not looking at technology and how that will make the customer experience uh, seamless and they shouldn't even notice, you know, across channel what um, digital transformation 
is going on in the back end. Um, in terms of uh, work that I've done and what I really believe in is um, the back end, which is my, um, my personal experience. So working in um, product creation, using uh, 3D printing for sampling in-house instead of sending um, sampling, uh, sending your sampling strategy to, let's say, Asia, uh, where, you know, you're losing time and money. Um, digital fitting, uh, digital twins, where you can use digital twins for marketing, for marketplace, and for wholesale. Uh, I think there's a lot of places where digitization can um, occur, and it can help uh, remove uh, those manual processes and redundancies, using data to make things cleaner, better, um, inventory. <laughs> There's so many things that we can talk about. Um, so it's really about, yes, digital is here to stay, but really what processes are you putting in place to actually make an impact to the customer? I love it. So, I mean, you know, Jonathan's viewpoint is really, um, you know, you've got the experience in, in developing the high level strategy on how do we operationalize? How do we shift our go-to-market strategy? And how does data um, tie into that? And uh, and Lisa, you know your your perspective on uh, how do we how do we drive an Im implementation uh, on the ground of of some of those strategies? Uh, Jeremy, you're really on the front lines on a day-to-day -day basis um, with with clients who are who are uh, fighting this this battle, and and many of them are just beginning their their digital transformation journey. Um, you know what is what does that mean to you? What does digital transformation uh, mean to you in these times? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, digital transformation is has got to be one of the most confusing expressions that's overused and misused. Uh, it kind of makes you think that the goal is to become digital uh, when it, it really isn't, um, and whatever whatever digital means as well, right? Um, the goal is really for companies to help to deliver incredible customer experience that help drive revenue at the end of the day. Um, and digital is a way that we can open up new revenue streams, do things differently. It's really a, a, a means rather than a, a, an end. And so I, I see, you know, I guess I've seen that a lot in my career consulting prior to, to um, joining Simply Feel where uh, there, you, you see lots of players being confused about um, what the goal is and just trying to implement as many possible digital experiments as possible. And you see huge wastes of energy over the place um, with, with that. Um, so pardon my rant here. Uh, the, um, you know, what we do at Simply Feel, we, we really work with uh, companies, medium and large, to help them um, achieve their goals. And the goals tend to vary a little bit given different sizes, channels, verticals, uh, but largely they have to do with communication, efficiency, and customer ex experience. Uh, th that's in general. Uh, what we've seen in 2020 with some of the major shifts uh, in, the, um, in the market um, is that the goals of brands have shifted fairly dramatically on very targeted uh, quick wins in order to ensure a few things, uh, to ensure safety uh, for their employees and for their, uh, and for their customers, uh, defending revenues, and also upgrading some of the remote experiences that they can offer to their, uh, to their client base. We've seen a lot of cross-channel integrations, lots of virtual appointments so that you can actually still leverage your store teams remotely. Uh, we've seen lots of things happening around fulfillment so that you can uh, take better advantage of some of the, um, the uh, different channels with click and collect, faster deliveries. Uh, and then we've seen a lot uh, around compliance monitoring in store as well. That's been for us a major focus at Simply Feel in particular, where um, you know, compliance is, is critical. You need to ensure that you're uh, meeting the local regulations that are in place at that specific moment, ensuring that your people understand them and that they're complying with them uh, so that your employees feel safe, are safe, and so, and so are your, um, your customers so they actually uh, are eager to go back into the stores. Uh, so it's, it's been really, uh, really interesting for us this year to help uh, our customers meet those, um, those increased uh, requirements for, for compliance and in-store visibility. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jeremy. I mean, I think uh, one interesting thing that you mentioned is is global complexity, 
right? So most of the customers that we work with and most of the businesses that um, I've been a part of, um, you know, digital transformation is uh, required to, to manage increasing global complexity, whether that's regulations or uh, Jonathan, as you know very well, data, data requirements and data regulations drive, um, drive uh, the need for more and more sophisticated uh, solutions and, and more effective solutions because ultimately this is um, about performance. Uh, to me, it's about survival, um, particularly right now. Um, we look at um, the companies that are, um, that are leading the pack, Nike and Walmart might, might be an example, but some of the other companies like Target, for example, that um, was very early on in implementing um, uh, buy online, pick up in store technology. I, I try hard not to say the word BOPIS, but um, because that's a funny word, but um, you know, that, that implemented some of these, um, these solutions um, more quickly and in a more agile way. Um, it's, it's future proofing, but these days to me, it's, it's present proofing. You know, you are making sure that you can meet the, um, the challenging uh, conditions that, that we have today. And finally, you have to be uh, relevant to your customers. So, um, you know, Jonathan in our, in our pregame um, uh, chat was talking a little bit um, about um, some, some work um, uh, that was done uh, regarding, um, at Nike regarding um, uh, customer, customer data and understanding the audiences better. I worked at a company called Network Insights for a long time that uh, helped build very granular audiences to help understand what's more, what makes uh, you more relevant to your very specific, very niche um, clients. So relevance, I think, is, is very key. Uh, and that includes having a relevant in-store experience uh, that works for clients in today's conditions uh, uh, and, and right now. So relevance to me um, is key. Uh, performance is key. We have to do more with less now. Um, and the stakes are higher than ever. Um, you know, there are plenty of retailers and brands that are hit very hard uh, by this scenario. Uh, and they need to make up ground. They need to find solutions in order to drive better performance uh, with their talent. And, and to me, that's part of what digital transformation uh, is. I yeah. think, go ahead. Yeah, I'd love to expand just for a minute because you said it and Lisa, you said it as well. You know, I'll, I'll call it a, we no longer can survive with the old mentality that we leave it up to our market managers, our store managers, or our retail directors in a certain market to read their audience, read their customer, and make a gut decision on what they think the right product assortment should be or what the right mix, um, you know, or, or advertisements should be. Now it really is table stakes to have a global strategy and focus on the consumer with a global consumer knowledge, uh, you know, a strategy and team. It's also table stakes to have a global data and analytics strategy so that you can pull that product data and that customer data together and drive insights out of what you're finding in the markets and make better decisions um, top down and bottoms up with informed data-driven decisions, not gut decisions in the market. Um, and, and that was a real key factor in the success of Nike. Um, it was also a key factor in Walmart in the early days of realizing that for us to stay competitive, we had to get out of the brick and mortar mindset and adopt that marketplace mindset um, to become you know, the Walmart version of eBay when we started implementing a marketplace where you could get products that weren't even sold underneath the Walmart banner. Um, but we provided that, that marketplace to that global, um, really that global product and data uh, strategy with our consumer focus. And, and that is so critical because consumers are demanding something very hard from us. And that is, I want a customized experience based on my preferences, my friends, my environment. And they want that hyper-focused customization, that hyper-focused experience. Um, and we have to be ready to analyze that at a global scale and then deploy strategies back into the market that meet that need. Yeah, and I think that really ties into um, when you talk about the hyper, um, I talk about hyper localized. So using that global data and what you understand from um, the customer evolution and what they want every day is changing um, based on their actual local needs. So I think that using that global data to hone down on a curated assortment and uh, using customer validation um, 
tools, uh, digital tools to help really um, that merchant understand what that customer needs in that local market. I think um, customer data is so important, but also getting that um, adoption, the staff adoption, getting people on board to actually use the technology. Otherwise the technology is useless and it would fail. Yeah, what and to, oh, go, Jeremy, yeah go no, to, to expand on the, this is a fascinating topic on just kind of the interactions between headquarter teams and the, and the boots on the ground, right? Uh, where, yes, you, you can't just rely on the boots on the ground to make all the gut decisions as, as Jonathan was, uh, was calling out here. Uh, there's also a need uh, to, to ensure that you can better understand what is happening on the ground, especially in this crazy environment we're living in right now, mm. where, you, you know, your people in, in the store have lots to share with you. And so it's important that they're not just sharing with themselves and taking decisions, but rather that they uh, share very broadly within the organization that you have the right communication channels so that you can gather all of those um, market insights on what's happening within your stores, but also outside of your stores, right? You have uh, hundreds of folks that are in the field living their lives too and have see interesting things that your competitors are doing. You need to be able to leverage uh, all of those insights as well uh, to empower your um, your teams to to share those things broadly so that you can utilize those insights. I think that's, that's really critical to today. Yeah, one thing that really excites me is um... I've been in sort of the the data game starting early on in um, in in HR analytics and HR surveys and voice surveys. And one thing that's always been more most exciting to me about data, which is a really um, nerdy way to start a start a sentence, um, is uh, is is qualitative data. So when we think about data, we think about numbers and graphs and and dashboards. But you know what technology has been able to do over the over the last you know 10, 15 years in being able to handle large qual large quantities of qualitative data, and by that I mean, you know, you have uh, you know field reps out in the field um, who are capturing like qualitative comments on what's going on in the stores every day, and in, and they do it on on mass, right? And if you are collecting and sorting and organizing that data, that qualitative data, those those real world comments about what are going on, not not checking the box, but um, you know, understanding if you have, you know, 5,000 uh, comments from your, your store employees and you've got a word cloud that brings up the, the biggest concern, you know, the ability to, to process um, qualitative data is, is key. And just, you know, in order to do that, you have to empower your team to, um, to share. You have to make it engaging for them to share. And, and that's certainly one of the things that, that we're, we're focused on. Um, Great. So I think now we're gonna uh, we're gonna get really wild and really crazy, and we're gonna we're gonna try something um, that that I got to be honest, I've I've never never really tried before. And um, our head of demand, Jen Emily, who is um, is down there in the, the gallery view, is gonna gonna help us out with this. We're gonna try a survey, a Zoom survey. So um, getting getting pretty wild. And and the question today is gonna be, um, I think Emily, you want to go ahead and, and and try to launch the survey. Boom, we're live, it works, I'm so excited. Uh, so I've got a, a pretty simple uh, question for you today about, uh, obviously there are plenty of directions that we could take the idea of digital transformation. What we're interested in today is um, which uh, priorities that you could be following through on are your main priorities for technology investment in 2021. Uh, we're fully uh, aware of the fact that the other uh, could be a very, very, um, a very long, long list. But um, what we tried to uh, include here um, is a number of uh, big, chunky subjects that um, our clients talk to us uh, most about, uh, as well as folks like uh, Forrester um, mentioned. So while you're um, choosing, um, you can choose one or you can choose many of these. Um, uh, we're going to see if we can tabulate the scores. And in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and uh, move ahead and talk a little bit about, um, let's see if I can move that, about what Forrester is saying the top uh, investment priorities are for, for 2020. And we're going to see if we can compare once the results have been tabulated to uh, what the fine folks at, at Forrester are identifying. Now, mind you, this, these results came out in May. 
which is, means they were probably collecting this data just as the proverbial crap was hitting the fan with, with COVID. So no, no telling on, uh, on how accurate um, uh, these, these are um, now uh, with everything that's going on. But uh, I suspect, uh, you know, uh, quite a few of them uh, maybe. I, I think for Simple Field, obviously advanced analytics is something that we're excited to see on there. AI machine learning solutions are um, the types of things that um, we see a lot of clients embracing and um, that, that we touch on with our solution, uh, as well as there's some um, associate uh, facing digital uh, store technology uh, and, and operations, of course. Um, I'm curious, and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Lisa, w with your clients, um, where are the, the biggest areas of, of priority that you um, see, see these brands and, and retailers uh, in, in their investment? Does this list ring true to you or where would you see the biggest interest points? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, it, it all rings true. The only thing um, that I don't see is a lot of the back end um, digital uh, technologies uh, that retailers are investing in, um, like the tools that designers need um, to, to design product and create product, um, or in merchandising uh, in terms of using machine learning and AI to actually um, optimize assortment. I think those things are, are missing um, from the list specifically um, for the back end, and of course, like supply chain capabilities. But I would say, um, you know, getting from my um, experience, just getting uh, that standardization and the seamlessness that digitization brings. I think that is that is really key for a lot of my uh, customers. Gotcha. And I, I would imagine, Jonathan, that there's there's a whole world of products that. <laughs> in your world as chief data officer that, that this doesn't even touch. Oh yeah. And, and I'm, I'm glad to see obviously advanced analytics, data analysis at the top of the list that, uh, you know, as I said earlier, that is table stakes and becoming critical. Um, but omni-channel doesn't surprise me either. And as, especially with COVID, our stores, our stores have shut down. People are, you know, buying in mass online even more than they ever have. And the, the big brands that had historically depended on that in-store traffic um, are really having to, to push hard to, to change up how they, how they deliver product through that channel. Um, but the, there's, there's a whole host of products. And, um, you know, one thing kind of like Lisa said is, is that internal transformation that has to take place to bring in the right technologies, the right tools to um, enable the strategy for the digital transformation and value proposition that you're trying to do in the market. And, um, and sometimes it's not what you think it is. I, I love to use um, Under Armour. I, I knew a couple of guys there that were working on their digital transformation. And it was pretty neat to see them go out and through an M&A exercise, gather digital products that were in the marketplace and in use across exercise and fitness and, um, you know, food and, and the health and and leverage those platforms, bring them in-house and use that data to get better insights into their consumer. Um, and with, with Nike, it was very similar. We went out and created a membership program that gave discounts and incentives to leverage that, that connected your in-store purchases with your online purchases um, and connected your online presence with YouTube and, and Facebook and other, other channels to gather all this consumer insight and then leverage um, advanced analytics, which has AI, uh, you know, and machine learning behind it to really get insights out of that information to understand the, the movement in, in, the, in the consumer marketplace. Christian, I, would, I would also add like social shopping on here. I think um, that is huge <laughs> right yeah. now, especially with what's going on um, in luxury. Uh, you know, and how luxury is now actually embracing technology and digital, which, you know, as we know, they're a little bit slow um, to that world, but uh, even looking at um, what Burberry is doing and um, other brands that are actually tar targeting the millennials and the Gen Z uh, yeah. market. So they are more uh, socially shopping advanced, <laughs> you know? So I think that's something that we should add to that list. Yeah, what Burberry is doing, uh... Uh, both, both with their, with their um, social selling, but also like their creative right now is just crushing it, man. They are so innovative and they're really exciting brands um, right now. Uh, Jeremy, your thoughts on this? 
I mean, so th there's definitely quite a few themes that that resonate. Um, what we see, I guess, I'll, I'll take my um, my simply field lens here. And another what we see from our clients and prospects, especially uh, in the past several months, is a, a need to do more with less uh, to consolidating some tools to ensure that they have very cohesive um, uh, staff member experience at the, in, in retail and in wholesale. Uh, we've seen a massive need to, to push towards more compliance, especially because uh, you have your, your, your middle management that's basically unable to go visit the stores the way they used to. Uh, and so you need to sell, set yourself a whole new set of processes in order to and means of controlling that uh, your stores are what they should be. Um, and so it, a lot of what we're seeing around, you know, in this list around associate facing technologies, um, around omnichannel capabilities too, makes a lot of sense too, because while you have uh, all of your, your teams that now are seeing much fewer, um, much less traffic uh, in store, how do you utilize them in different ways? So that's been a, a huge push we've seen uh, our customers make in the, in the last uh, few months. Agreed. Uh, so now we're going to see uh, ex exactly how well our little experiment uh, went. Uh, Emily, can we see the results? Boom. All right. Fantastic. Uh, okay, great. Well, it looks like uh, I'm, I'm not too terribly surprised um, that analytics and dashboarding is um, near the top of the, the priority list um, with, with this one. And um, actually, the results kind of echo, I think, um, some of your comments. I think um, obviously Simplefield promoted this audience, so it's totally skewed towards um, the type of things that, that we offer. But um, you know, it, it is it is clear that you know omni-channel is is near the top. Um, retail execution probably not a real um, real surprise since we uh, compete in, in this space um, is also a a, a big one. Uh, let's go down a little bit further and digital store. Uh, tech. One that's on here that I think is, is fascinating is, um, is process automation. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a class of software called uh, robotic process automation, which um, sounds a little big and bad and scary. Um, but really, um, I think at the center of driving efficiency, there's more and more um, embrace uh, amongst retailers and, and, and brands about, uh, and really, all, honestly, all, all types of business. Um, about the ability to automate internal processes um, that otherwise um, take uh, loads of, of unnecessary and redundant manual work. Um, we've been working closely with um, our clients um, on automating workflows with, with simple things within our system, uh, but look to work with them also on bringing in external data and tying it to our system um, and, and driving action um, in ways that are automated and that can save massive amounts of hours and labels so, uh, and labor. So process automation, um, good, to, good to see that one on there um, as well. So um, I think I'm gonna move on because- I well, Let me, yeah, ahead. let me just add to that process automation. I'm not surprised to see that at all because I think yep. in, in some of my experience, I'll use Walmart as an example. You know, there was a very, very deep focus on cost and overhead associated with driving the lowest price. Yeah. And as more retailers um, and consumer, you know, packaged good companies and, and manufacturers realize that the market competition is getting fierce and we all do it. We walk into a store, we look at your product and then we pull it up on Google and go see where we can buy it for the cheapest price to get competitive in that space. You've got to leverage process automation and RPA to reduce the cost on the back end associated with that, the total cost of your goods. And, and, and be able to match those online prices of folks that have lower overhead or, or in some cases, automated processes. And so we, we stood up an entire uh, global office um, called the Global Business Office, but it was a, a GB, uh, GBS you know, type role that pulled in all the global, global processes with a focus on uh, automation and RPA, focus on reduction and overhead associated with those processes. Um, to really drive out that cost associated with um, those very complex processes across the entire entire supply chain and, and company. And that was why you were at 
uh, Walmart or is that Ni the Nike experience you're speaking? I was at Walmart and I've seen similar strategies. Um, matter of fact, where I'm at now with LP, we're going through a, a very similar approach with global business services to to help consolidate, pull this together, and have a united strategy around um, process automation and and efficiency. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think about the thing about process automation, the sort of automation, the sort of least scary um, way to introduce it to people is um, I think about in the marketing world right now, how, how reliant I, I am on Zapier, tying together one system to the other in a very simple way. When somebody signs up for this webinar, I get a notification on my Slack system, tying one, one, uh, one system uh, to another, um, and then building workflow steps uh, within there. I think um, you know, there's so much efficiency that can be uh, brought about by those, by those types of technologies. Uh, I, I did want to highlight that, you know, one of the parts of digital transformation uh, that, that help, has people's eyes glazing over is just the sheer wall of the types of products that you could have. And one thing I want to emphasize is that a product is not a strategy. A solution is not a strategy. Simple field is not your strategy, but it helps enable your strategy. So you know, I think that's something I want to uh, dive into a little bit here is, you know, how do we get started? It's great to, to, to say buzzwords about digital transformation, but how do we get started? I know, Jonathan, um, you know, in, in the past, I've, I've uh, heard you uh, preach the good word about starting with a strategy and starting with the end in mind. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about your, your thoughts and where do you start? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give some cliff notes around, look, how do you do this? Um, and uh, selfishly, I'm going to start with data um, and data analytics. But you know, let me let me paint a picture. Of probably where most of our many companies are today, we manage our data within silos of a business function or a market, and then we have insights. And those insights are driven again at a business functional level or a market. And that's great for trying to leverage analytics and leverage insights for that specific view but it's very difficult to make strategic decisions across the enterprise, especially with digital transformation when that's your strategy. And so um, the, the simplest thing you can do first is up-level a strategy around data and analytics as a company and put that at a very senior place in the, in the organization because you want that leader and you want that organization to drive a framework and a strategy and standardization across all of your business functions um, in, in all markets. And the goal is not to centralize everything into one giant office and army of data analysts. The goal is to create that center of expertise that can then go out into the markets and build partnerships to say, hey, keep doing your insights for what you need. But if you'll connect in with my strategy and we'll work together to build some integrations that are consistent and, and you know low cost across the company, uh, that would feed data and information back up to an enterprise view. And so um, we did that very much at Walmart and Nike and at LP. Our vision has been creating an enterprise view of information that we can then trust and provide credible business intelligence back to um, all levels of the company. And in many cases, if you do that right, you're providing value uh, both to your executive team, your leadership, but also value back into those markets or those business units um, functionally that, that can leverage that new platform. Um, and it becomes a very symbiotic relationship. Um, and then there's other areas, I mean, just not to get too technical, but tactical, but like HR, we did consolidate HR reporting back in, um, but in sales, we've got a mini data analytics team out in sales that we empower and that we work with to, to leverage that strategy. So you've got to start there. You've got to find a leader who can bring the vision and strategy in and, um, really evangelize the the purpose and the value add that it delivers um, and create a cultural obsession around data and analytics. I know that sounds nerdy, but you know it's it's what's needed because if you go in saying we're going to do governance around data, people are just gonna they're gonna glaze over and go, oh crap. <laughs> <It's Yeah. laughs> longer processes. Um, so it just yeah, just evangelizing, creating that cultural obsession and that leadership focus. Um, strategically is, is really a critical place to start. And then I would argue that in addition to that, there are other capabilities you really need to level up within the organization around processes and around technology 
to create that global office of strategy, so to speak, that's going to drive your digital transformation. So a strong, strong strategy, strategy to start uh, a champion who knows the space and, and uh, is focused um, on, on this. <coughs> I think that's a, a great high level strategy, a high level approach. Um, we also spent a lot of time in Simple Field talking about the idea of crawl, walk, run. So uh, not everyone has that role in place. Not everyone has that full strategy in place. Uh, but a lot of the, uh, the folks that are responsible for the direct operational um, aspects of, of, of their teams um, understand that they need to affect change themselves uh, and need a way to do that quickly. Uh, so Jeremy, I think um, I, I want to go to you real quickly just to talk about uh, when you have clients who are getting started on their journey, um, you know, how do you suggest they, they, they start thinking about this? What are the baby steps that we can, uh, can take to, to get the journey started? Yeah, I mean, so the first step in crawl, walk, run is, is really before that to commit uh, to, uh, you know, launching initiatives, big and small, just simply doesn't really work if there's not very serious commitment from leadership from the top that's, that's driving what you're doing. Strategy is great, digital strategy maybe, uh, but the ongoing uh, commitment to change management is much better. Uh, and it's what's really important to, in order to make things work. Um, so is that, you know, and my advice to digital beginners tends to be to spend some time establishing your vision uh, from the top, communicating it over and over again uh, at a uh, aspirational level, spend very little time trying to detail out exactly what that vision means super specifically, avoid getting into analysis paralysis and spending uh, months and months, probably years for some players in figuring out what, what are we doing next? Because no, uh, and instead um, spend lots of time defining and communicating the key things that you want to achieve in the very short term in the next three to six months so that you have uh, very specific milestones that are driving you towards uh, that ambition that you have for your, you know, your, that longer term vision I was talking about. Um, th this is exactly what we, we tend to do at Simply Field with our clients and with our prospects. We, we really want them to understand and see all the possibilities that we bring to them and to their operations, but we also spend probably even more time, especially within uh, my team, to force them to be realistic and minimalistic to start with so that we may get adoption from their teams on simple and meaningful things that empower uh, their, uh, their people in the, at the store level in the field. And from there expand because you have some assets that are in place. You know, Jonathan was calling out how it's, it's so critical that you have a, a data strategy that's really in place because that's your backbone for a lot of things. I, I tend to think of the same way of, of simply feeling the, the store operation specifically, where you start with a few things and because you have this tool that's structuring the way you can work with your with your store teams, you can expand from that, you know, away from the simple use cases that we start with to some more, much more sophisticated things too. Yeah. I. Um... Jonathan mentioned, uh, you know, building a data obsessed culture. Um, Love it. There, there's a there's a there's a baby step there, and that's um, the number of retailers and brands who have people working every single day, um, who can't every single day see in a very easy basis what their goals are, and how they're how they're achieving against their goals. At the most simple level, there are a number of really simple data points. Um, that we can help our clients share that um, you know that are just about performance. They're just simply this is what we're trying to do, and this is how you're how you how you're measuring against it. And you know, um, I, I've always talked a lot about the idea of it's um, not measured, it's it's not managed. Um, and I really honestly believe that you know before even data obsession is uh, you know there's some there's some baby steps. If if your job is to accomplish X, you ought to be able to understand how you're doing against that goal at any given point in time. And I think probably across a lot of industries, we, we, don't, we don't quite have that. I can say that at Simple Field, we're a, a fairly uh, young uh, company and it, and it has been a journey to get to understanding where our marketing metrics are and how we're performing. Um, it is a journey and it, it doesn't happen overnight, but now we have a better understanding of how we perform. So 
Uh, I think for any role that that's, that's critical. I want to get a little bit into um, the subject of implementation. So let's say we've got a strategy. Um, you know, Jonathan has, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan has, has, has uh, drawn up a beautiful strategy. Uh, we've got the champion uh, in place uh, to help uh, implement. Um, Lisa, I know you have been really responsible for some gigantic mammoth uh, implementation efforts for some huge, huge companies. I wonder if you have any tips on, um, you know, how to, and, then, and maybe this feeds off of the how to get started, but, you know, how to be successful um, when you're implementing a large scale um, uh, implementation. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, just going back to how do we get started, um, my biggest thing is really getting the best understanding of your customer as you possibly can. So really knowing what your customer wants, how they're evolving, what they need, what they're buying, how they shop, um, and what do they want. Uh, and that ties into um, a successful implementation because once you get your customer really understood, moving into your staff and getting them on board, empowering them, getting them part of the process and the journey will lead to a successful um, transition. Just because if you don't get the people on board, you're managing that change and understanding that shift in mindset. If you can't get them on board, your technology is not going to be implemented um, because they will fight the process. So really um, having that um, seamless integration across whether it's your uh, frontline staff, your backend staff, the people actually doing the job, but really um, anyone that's customer facing, I think that's really key. Yeah, I love I love that feedback. Um, yeah, I think probably all of us uh, use on a daily basis in our work worlds, we, we have access to a large number of tools that never get used. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in order for a digital transformation to be successful, to make an impact, you've got to drive usage, you've got to drive adoption, you've got to um, make people believe. Um, Jeremy, that's, uh, that's your job. So uh, <laughs> maybe you can uh, provide us some tips on kind of our next slide, which is about communication and change management. How do we get people on board and adopting these tools? Um, yeah, so if, I mean, a few things that are table stakes. Uh, commitment from the year I was talking about earlier. Um, having the right short-term tactical planning and resourcing that's, uh, that's in place so that you can quickly implement new projects, uh, always critical. A commitment to change management and communications is uh, also necessary in order to implement any change and underestimating those pieces is uh, you know, a rookie mistake. Um, once uh, some of like, the initial implementations complete, we tend to then, you're, you were talking a second ago, Rich, about how do I measure things out? So we spend lots of time with our clients uh, on a regular basis at post implementation in uh, reviewing their goals, updating them, understanding how we're tracking against those objectives um, so that we make sure that we can continue to drive value uh, for the brand, for the end users. Uh, Monitoring metrics is critical in order to understand uh, for us how our clients are, are doing, how much value they're, go they're getting from the platform, and for our clients to understand how their people and stores are being compliant, being uh, on top of, um, of their key processes. Uh, it's really important to ensure that good habits that we set up during the implementation phases are deeply ingrained and that means monitoring a lot of the metrics in place and so we help our, our clients do that so that you're not moving backwards ultimately yeah i think it's important to to acknowledge that like as i said in the beginning a a, a solution is is not a strategy so i mean when we implement yeah. solutions we also need to make sure that we're addressing the cultural issues and the process issues what i think about every sales team I've ever worked with uses Salesforce and Salesforce can do a lot of things and it's completely irrelevant if the sales team does not work and follow the process to use the tool to affect the change and impact the results. So um, those things are, are very key. We're going to, we're going to try one more flying without a, a net moment here and ask you one more survey question. Emily, you ready? Boom. Um, so it's, 
uh, driving uh, successful implementations and driving digital transformation is not just uh, about a solution or a policy. Um, it's, a, it's a big journey and there's a lot of challenges around the, the way. Uh, what are your biggest challenges um, around digital transformation today? Is it lack of internal agility? Um, you've got some old legacy systems or I know a, a big uh, concern right now for a lot of people is, is budget and, and COVID uncertainty. So um, if you can participate in one more survey for us, that would mean that we've successfully run two surveys in one webinar. A new, a new simple field uh, record will be celebrating uh, for days and days. Um, you know, so I, I think maybe I wanna go back to this question a little bit and, uh, and, and Jonathan, I think, you know, you've led these, these types of efforts for um, a, a number of companies. I also know that on a consulting level, you, you've, you've done a lot of this type of work. You know, what's the, what have you seen as being the, the biggest blocker to success? Yeah, I, there's a couple of things I'll touch on. I mean, you said it yourself, we've got a crawl, walk, run. And if you meant a, a big strategy and you ask for, you know, a, a big team and you try to go off and drive it, but suddenly you disappear for two years and spend $2 million, million on tools and a data warehouse and, and then come back and say, here you go, your audience is going to be gone and the few that are remaining are going to be completely fatigued. And so... Yeah. Um, it is so important to focus on those quick wins right out of the gate to build the strategy and execute with your your teams and with your organization so that you bring them along the journey. Um, and another favorite example is sitting in front of a bunch of manufacturers in a plant. We asked the question, what would you guys predict if you could? And they had no idea. And that was a learning for us to say, wait a second, we need to bring our, our people along the journey with us, teach this capability start small, like you said, crawl, walk, run. Um, and I, I think that's, that's been a big, a big blocker. It's just the, the assumption we can easily make that everyone understands this, this, what digital transformation is. They understand the tools and the technologies and let's just go do it. And we, we, we don't stop to think through the change management required to bring that, the business along with us. Richard, I'd like to bring up just three things before time runs out and I can't pay them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing I wanted to bring up is um, really understanding the legacy systems that we're dealing with. I mean, none of them speak to each other. Retail is known for having like so many legacy systems at Ralph Lauren. I think we still have 11. <laughs> then, you know, none of them talk to each other. So that's the first thing I wanted to bring up. The second thing was um, the labor challenge, I think, in retail is really interesting because in order for um, retail to move into this uh, digital space and, you know, advanced um, digitization, they need to hire the right people. And the problem with retail is that they actually don't pay as well as, um, you know, companies like a Google or an Apple who are hiring like the data scientists and the people that we need to actually um, really level set this uh, digital transformation. And the third thing I want to bring up is um, our current state. You look at what our frontline sales staff are dealing with right now. They become security guards, you know, making sure you're wearing a mask, making sure you're following um, physical distancing rules, and they become um, a fulfillment center in a lot of cases. Um, you know, whether it's buy online, pick up in store, or it's curbside, or it's you know, we're going to bring it to your car. They, how are they um, able to use digital uh, tools in order to upsell or actually, you know, make their lives a little bit easier because they are given so much more responsibility right now in this pandemic. So those are the three things I really wanted to bring up and I'm sorry for just speeding through them. No, but, that's um, great. Yeah. That's great. And I think a lot of those kind of are, are addressed in some some of these, these challenges uh, up here. I think uh, you brought up the, the labor situation. I mean, honestly, uh, let's just be real too. It's just like, there's a lot of pain out there. And there's a lot of people that have lost their jobs. Um, you know, it's we're in an interesting space at Simple Field in that a lot of our clients are uh, currently better funded um, luxury groups, for example, cosmetics companies, companies that um, ha have some direct to consumer um, components, companies that have um, that are, are that are brands that are that are weathering the storm. Um, but uh, also a lot of our, our clients are um, are calling us to let us know that um, they have less people to work with. Um, and I think you know, that's one of the things that when we think about process automation we think about virtual store visits we don't think about um we don't think about replacing human beings we think about dealing with the pain and you know the the targets haven't changed 
the sales targets haven't changed, but the, the talent and the human beings that need to accomplish this work to be successful, um, you know, there, there's not as many of them. Um, and there may not be with you know, a series of lockdowns, depending on how things happen, depending on the region, obviously, you know, we, um, we have clients in all kinds of different regions, which are, are different, um, different uh, stratas. Like for example, in Asia Pacific, we have, you know, um, there's a number of our clients that have thriving, uh, thriving stores in areas that haven't, uh, have, have recovered or haven't been as deeply, deeply affected. So um, there's a pretty wide uh, difference in, in the type of folks, but agreed it's, um, you know, the, the, the labor part, I, I, we talk a lot about talent, you know, what's going to get us out of this scenario? What's, what's going to get a, a, the retail industry and, and, and for brands, get them out of the rut. And it's, um, it's really talented people. So we need to be empower, empowering those people with the tools they need, but, but also the support and, and, uh, and to your point, uh, it sounds like compensation may be, a, may be an issue as well. Uh, Jeremy, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so clearly all of the above are important. I love the, love the point you made, uh, Lisa, about the position. The, uh, the retail associates are, are put in uh, with, uh, you know, half security guard, half fulfillment center um, positioning. It, it's so critical. Uh, now more than ever, really, to for brands to remember that uh, the store is not a place to sell goods only. It's really all about bringing experience to to customers. Uh, and yes, the pandemic is um, changing a lot of the possibilities in store right now. It's changing uh, a lot of the givens around around traffic you know I'm, i mean i'm sitting in new york and every time i drive through midtown and see like all of the closed stores or the stores they're just getting zero traffic with an insane rent uh, it's it's a different world out there but uh, this being said it's it's still important for brands to be looking for those ways to uh, delight their customers uh, even in this different environment uh, to find ways to uh, you know yes uh, you know, look for upsells in their um, in their interactions. To uh, look for ways to to surprise uh, their customers when they do come back to them. To surprise them in different ways to remotely, and I think that's uh, th that's something that brands are you know are very focused on protecting their their revenue right now, which is very understandable. Uh, but it shouldn't make them lose sight of, you know, what is it, what, what is the experience that we want to make sure we continue to deliver to, uh, to our customer base? Yeah, I think our, um, our, our slogan for the longest time has been uh, excellent experiences every day in every store. And, and maybe it should change to uh, excellent experiences every day in every way, uh, because it's not just about the store. The, the experience has to carry through um, uh, to, to a lot of other areas. Uh, Emily, let's see what what the scoreboard says. What the what the survey says. The price is right. Boom. Okay. I mean, it looks like a lot of what's being pinpointed here to me. Uh, not a huge end size, but a lot of what's being pinpointed here is internal struggles. Um, so lack of internal agility, no cor corporate stat strategy, and lack of internal talent seem to be the things that are. Um, they're driving problems. Certainly, budget and, like like Lisa uh, pointed out, those those internal legacy systems uh, are uh, are definitely a, a huge issue. So, a lot of work to be done in in, in building uh, a data obsessed culture, as you said said Jonathan, and 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 helping to to champion this idea of of digital transformation. We have roughly two minutes, um, so uh, I wanted to get to there's there's one question um, that I want definitely want to get to because it's a doozy and it's. Uh, does digital transformation uh, ever end? And and uh, I think with the time, that's maybe too big of a question to, to to answer. But let's let's give it a quick shot. Lisa, does digital transformation ever end? No. <laughs> I say <laughs> yeah, no because the customer is always evolving. So yeah. you need to keep up with what the customer is doing. Great, Jeremy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a strong no as well. Digital transformation is, is not is not a thing. Uh, it's uh, it's business transformation that's enabled by digital, and then the the moment you stop, uh, you know, thinking about your customers, thinking about your operations, thinking about new um, opportunities in the market, you you're gone. And the digital should enable you to do those things. It shouldn't be like the uh, end goal. 
it took like 59 minutes, but I think you just gave me the, my favorite definition of digital transformation, which is business transformation enabled by digital. That's, that's solid, solid stuff right there. You should, you should TM that, Jeremy. I, d- I did spend a little bit too much time in consulting. <laughs> it shows. Jonathan, you want to you wanna squeeze one in? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, doesn't end your customer changes. It's really up to you uh, to decide. Is your value proposition going to stay the same as it always has been, or is it going to change? And that's what digital transformation is all about. Fair enough. Well, thank you guys so much. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I could continue for, for hours on end, and hopefully we'll, uh, when this is all over, we'll do so over, uh, over strong cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and thank you to the audience for, uh, for listening in. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that haven't been addressed, uh, we'll get to them. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to pass them along to Lisa, Jonathan, or Jeremy. Uh, or answer them myself. Uh, again, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch uh, with this webinar recording and uh, and a recap that um, that boils down some of these insights. So thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you.